as most of you know, I'm Eric Trinkus. I've been around here for a while and I know most of you personally. Um, and what I wanna do is talk uh, a little bit today. It's a bit of a show and tell, um, but talk to you about megalithic monuments of France, um, a few of which are, are well known, most of which are not very well known. And I wanna give you an idea of the, the variety of them, uh, both some th thoughts on the main ones, but also some thoughts on, on a number of others. The one you're looking at there on the title slide is La Roche aux Fées, uh, which I will come back to. Uh, and I will also talk about Bernanez, uh, which was referred to as, in the footnote there by André Malraux as Le Partenon des Bretons. Uh, it's in Northern Brittany. But let me, um, let me continue in. The first thing I wanna do is talk a little bit about um, how I and, and Kim uh, got into this, and for some reason, um, uh, uh, and I wanna point out that, that this developed out of something that, that Kim and I did on various times from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s that um, we took vacations in, in rural parts of France um, and we wandered around the countryside and one of the things that we started discovering, looking at maps like this, this is from Northern Brittany uh, near Marais, um, uh, is that there are a number of indications on these maps of various historic monuments, but also the megalithic monuments. And if you look very closely at this map, uh, you will see um, uh, indications of them. Uh, there are a bunch of them circled. This is one little area of Northern Brittany. And if you go around and visit them, these are the kind of things that you see. Um, there are megalithic uh, monuments uh, scattered around the countryside. Some of them are nicely taken care of uh, with the grass mowed around them. Some of them are off in the woods. Some of them are alongside the road. Um, it's, it's something that we had a lot of fun doing. It's something that's a great way, a wonderful way to actually see France, see the countryside of France, wander through little villages, stop in little towns and have destinations. And I, I, we strongly recommend uh, doing something like this. You don't have to look for, for megalithic monuments. You can look for Romanesque churches. You can look for all kinds of things like this. And it's a great way to get around the, um, get around the countryside. Um, but one thing that I'll warn you, uh, you know, we called it, when we did this, we called it La Chasse aux Dolmen. Um, and, and the one thing about La Chasse aux Dolmen, it's like the La Chasse aux Escargots in the Faux Pas Courrier Trop Vite, as a colleague of mine once said. Um, but anyway, it, it, it's great fun. I recommend it. And anyway, we were going through photographs from all of this. Um, we decided to, to sort of put something together. A number of these images are, are filled, uh, are from our travels. Some of them, are, a number of them are off the web where um, there were better ones on the web. And we continued on from there. Um, a, uh, megalithic monuments have been well known, recognized well known since well back in the in the 19th century in France. Uh, in 1844, Prosper Méride in his inventory, inventory of monuments in France recorded a large number of them. These are some late 19th century postcards of, from Loch Maria Caire in southern Brittany. I'll get back to that. And also from Normandy. I love the little girl down there. And if you read the um, caption, which I copied out from the postcard, it says, um, there are traces de rigol. Those are engravings on the stones. That's something that's quite rare, um, but I will show you uh, pictures of a couple of spectacular ones. Um, megaliths uh, became part of currency in with the emergence in the 60s and 70s of the Asterix, um, Bon Dessiné, Les Avengers d'Asterix. Um, I pulled out a couple of images of them with, uh, with dolmens on the side on the left there, and an Im image of Asterix and Obelix carrying his, his menhir. The dolmens shown there would, are, are perfectly in keeping with the Gallo-Roman times. Um, that's probably what they look like, much like today. Uh, carrying 
mania around as Obi Leaks is is completely anachronistic. Uh, it just it's just part of the story. Um, Megalithic monuments, uh, the, the ones that people tend to think about the most are the truly spectacular ones like Stonehenge in England, um, uh, Newgate or New, um, Newgrange in, in Ireland, some others, and also Carnock in France, which I'll get back to. Um, this map, uh, they are the really important series of them are, are in Western Europe. There are a few scattered elsewhere. The earliest ones shown in red on the map uh, are in Brittany, uh, Galicia in northwestern Spain, and in Roussillon down in the Catal uh, Catalonia um, in, in um, southern France. And those go back to seven to six thousand years ago. Um, that's three to four, uh, two to three thousand years prior to the oldest pyramids in Egypt. These things massively predate all of that work in Egypt, uh, which is admittedly impressive in itself. There's a more recent period, what's orange here, which is what's in the British Isles, as well as in Pointe du Charon, Aquitaine, and then down the coast of Portugal, um, and also in Cantabrian Spain and Northern Spain. Um, these things were around for a long time. And a little bit on terminology. Um, Menia, what the Brits call standing stones, uh, consist of isolated ones, um, and which are which are now they're all by themselves or in or, or just a couple of them, and also um, alignments. And I'll show you uh, both of those. Dolmen, which is the term which is most commonly used, uh, consists of pierre levé, which is one or two very large stones. Uh, as a ca cap stones over uh, much, much smaller stones that are holding them up. Uh, Allée couverte or passage graves um, or the, the corridors that are covered over with series of cap stones. Um, there are a few tumuli that are stone covered, usually stone covered Allée couverte. And, and I point out there, as I, as I wrote, that all dolmens, as far as we know, were once covered by earthen mounds. Uh, there are very few examples of those that still remain, although some are still partially covered. Um, but over the over the millennia, the um, the earth over the tops of most of, of them have uh, have eroded away. And there are a few cases of what are referred to as stone platforms or table de sacrifice. Uh, it's very possible that many of those are simply capstones um, from Pierre Levé. Uh, that have fallen and, and ended up on the ground uh, and form a very large surface. So let's, um, let's just start looking at some of them. Um, and, and I'll start out with the one that gets the most attention, um, one that we wandered around through. Uh, if you look at the, at the photo in the bottom, you can see a couple of people kind of in the distance, kind of wandering around through them. Uh, these, are the, these are the main neck, uh, alignments at Kavnak. Um, I've actually heard that they're now cut, uh, fenced off because there were so many so many busloads of tourists going through there um, that they started getting damaged, unfortunately. Um, but they're uh, they are these impressive long alignments of of stones um, that that go across the hillside. Uh, they have gotten all kinds of attention. Um, uh, if any of you remember Von Donigan, uh for Von Donigan, this was a landing strip for UFOs. Uh, if, uh, if th there's a story from World War II of an American general who thought there were uh, tank traps, there are a variety of other interpretations of them. Uh, as I'll come back to, we really don't know why they're there. Um, we don't know why uh, five, uh, six thousand years ago, people, uh, people lined up all of these, but they are very impressive. And as, as I would get though, they're not the only alignments that we know, that they're just the biggest and the most complete. Um, and they're really very impressive. But what tends to, tends to get forgotten at Karnak is the Karnak complex. And by the way, I've included in these slides, I've included the département um, uh, locations of all, all of these. So Morbihan, is the département in the southern central part of Brittany. And I'll get to Finisterre, which is the northern and western part of Brittany. 
from Brittany, et cetera, and down the coast of France. Uh, that's the, the appropriate way to, to localize these, but I don't expect you to have a map of all these uh, de facto mall in your head. Um, okay, at Kalnak, it's the main neck alignments to get all the attention, but right alongside them and in the immediate the area around them, there are a number of other things. Uh, for example, there are um, uh, half a dozen or more uh, Ali Kuvert, and here, here are some of them. Uh, these things are um, uh, su very substantial and important in themselves. Uh, the one on the lower left, uh, Kerjaval, is, is, has come partly a, uh, apart, uh, partly fallen. Uh, the others are pretty much intact. Um, and, you know, as I go through these, um, their scales are not present in these um, in most cases, although you can see things like the fence in the Carmaria one. Um, but just bear in mind how big these things are. Um, they are, they're, the size, the massiveness, uh, especially of the capstones, but not exclusively of the capstones, um, are very impressive. And as you can see, these uh, some of these the uh, are still partially covered, lower parts of them. Um, uh, bear in mind that uh, back in back in the Neolithic, when these things were made, uh, they almost certainly would have been covered over. Um, th there are also some, some simple pierre levé in the area in Carnac, um, and these, uh, as you can see, the the upper two in particular. Um, the uh, the capstones are are truly truly massive. They're enormous chunks of rock. Um, the estimates on you know taking the measurements and estimating how much these things weigh would weigh um, they range between about thirty and fifty tons. They are um, they are massive amounts of rock. I, incl I included the one at the bottom, uh, Cruz Meken, uh, because as you see, a, a Christian cross has been put on top of this. Uh, I'm not going to go into it, but a substantial number of these megaliths uh, have had various kinds of modern, particularly religious uh, symbols put on them. Uh, they've been usurped uh, for um, for modern churches, the little metal crosses on top of Menir, et cetera, um, are not unusual, uh, but they're, um, they're impressive. But let's move on to some of the others. The other really big complex, which is not as big as, as, as spread out as Karnak, um, is the one at Loch Maria Kerr, or the Erkra one at Loch Maria Kerr. Uh, as you can see, it's right down by the coast in Southern Morbihan. And it consists of a tumulus, um, and I'll show you a picture, uh, a couple of pictures of that. Um, the Dolben des Marchands, which was in one of those postcard slides I showed you. Um, and the Grand Menier um, uh, Brise, uh, it, is, um, it was uh, uh, upright at one point in the, um, in the past, in the remote past. Uh, it's not entirely clear when it fell over. Uh, this gives you some details of it. There is the uh, the, the tumulus. Uh, it is open. It's all neatly neatly taken care of. Um, now um, you can go inside of it. Uh, as you can see from the entrance, the more detailed one in the on the right. There's a very large capstone. It's actually it's a it's an ali couvert. It's a whole series of capstones with thin vertical walls uh, that are holding them up. And then the whole thing was covered over with, with stones um, to form this tumulus or, or cairn as the, uh, as the British referred to them. And then there's a detail there of the, of the Dolmen des Marchands. If you remember back to the postcard picture I showed you in that postcard with the guy sitting up on top of it, the whole thing is raised up. And at some point, I don't know when, some point between the time that postcard photo was taken in the late 19th century, um, and, and, and today, um, it, it fell down on the ground, uh, it, it descended. And then you can see the Colmenia Brise, um, which would have been an enormous, an enormous chunk of rock standing up, uh, quite impressive. Um, there are others at Loch Maria Kerr. Um, there's, uh, and these are just a couple of the, um, 
of the Allée, two Allées Couvertes and a Menhir alongside the Pierre Platte one. Um, the, 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 I'm including these to show that there's, there's a lot of variety in these. They're the great big ones like the Tumulus and the Grand Menhir at, um, at Loch Maria Care or the, um, the, the alignments at, at Karnak, they get all of the attention. But as you wander around uh, the countryside uh, at these areas, um, there are lots of these that are not, um, they're not all tidied up. Um, they are, um, they're not all tidied up. They're just uh, there um, on the landscape. They've been cleaned out a little bit and you can see, you know, see where paths have been, uh, have been created by people walking around them. Um, a, a little bit further west, but still in Marbillon, is the, the complex of Kerzeo. Uh, you can see there the alignments. Um, they're not as big, they're not as complete, and not as tidy as the one, as the one at Karnak. Um, but it's another, another alignment um, uh, extending off through farmer's fields uh, that's been, and that is, uh, uh, it has dozens and dozens of these stones that presumably were originally all, all in lines. Um, there's a massive Pierre Levé alongside somebody's house. Um, and then there's a, uh, down the bottom, you can see a manier and, and what's referred to as a table de sacrifice, uh, but it could very well be the, um, the capstone of a, um, of a dolmen, um, a, a, a dolmen that is no longer no longer standing up, or the other stones are completely buried. Um, <clears throat> in in the same area, but out in the islands, is a another tumulus, Gavrinus, uh, which has this uh, again. This this one's all tidied up for tourism um, and and protected. Uh, and it, you can see it's a. Uh, Tumulus um, with um, again the the alley couvert and the and the stones piled up over it and there's a picture. This is the most spectacular of the ones that has engravings on it. These engravings along the the vertical vertical stones um, inside of it. You can see these these great swirl uh, fingerprint like designs that are engraved into the stones. Um, I've read that uh, they recently discovered that it's very similar engravings are on the outsides of, of these stones. I'm not quite sure how they found that out, um, but that um, if that is the case, then the stones must have been exposed on both sides for some period of time before the tumulus was built over on top of them. Again, a, a, a large tumulus and a massive complex. Um, the most impressive of these, this is the one that was referred to as Le Partinant des Bretons, uh, is Bernanez. This is on the, in, it's, it's in Finisterre, it's on the north coast of Brittany. Um, if, uh, it is, it's an enormous pile of rock, uh, a humongous pile of rock. You can get a, a couple of people standing uh, in the lower picture. Um, that happens to be me and our son when we went there. Um, in the, uh, it was sometime around 2010. Uh, the, it's uh, 70 meters long. There are 11 uh, chambers. Uh, the chambers have somewhat smaller stones than most of these uh, Ali Couvert. Um, you can see in the, the image, the, deep, the closer up image on the right, uh, that some of the ch uh, chambers were formed by corbeling, uh, corbel vaulting. Um, and not just with the, um, with the large stones. Um, there are 11 of these chambers uh, it, that they extend all along the length of it. It's up on a hill and you can see a little bit in the, um, uh, in the lower picture in the background, uh, it overlooks a, an estuary that's coming in off of the, uh, coming in off of the ocean in Northern Brittany. And, and by the way, the, the the gray sky and everything in the lower picture that was taken in the summer. Uh, this is this is Brittany. Brittany is a maritime climate. It's cold and it, and it's windy, as you can see from the way we're dressed. Uh, but this is a it's a massive it's a massive and incredibly impressive um, 
uh, monument uh, of these of these mega, of this megalithic complex. Um, and there are a variety a variety of others of these um, uh, ali couvert of different sizes uh, in um, in northern and western um, uh, Brittany in the uh, in Finisterre and in Côte d'Armor. Um, the it doesn't show in the picture, but the uh, the one um, uh, near Trégastel, uh, um near uh, Kergastel, which when we visited, it's just it's sitting alongside a road um, across the street from a housing development, um, and there were there were kids playing on skateboards in the street, whatever. As we went and looked at it, you know, it's right there. It's right that it's. It just kind of part of the scenery is part of the environment, and and people seem to treat them that way. Uh, they respect them. They don't muck around with them. Uh, it's on the map, so they get tourists like us coming and looking at them. Um, but there's these things are just kind of there as part of the landscape, and you just kind of look at them. Some of them with the massive stones, and you go, that's an impressive part of the landscape. There are also a variety of of mania scattered around Brittany. Um, some of these, like Chandolon and, and Carolas, are, are, are some of the largest that are known. The man dog there provides scale for that one. Uh, these are huge chunks of rock that, that were uh, standing up. Um, the, and then there are a couple that the two at the top are a bit smaller. These are not strictly to scale. Um, and and a picture below of another alignment. This is is it in Ile Vilaine, which is in the southeastern part of Brittany, um, quite some distance from Carnac, um and the others. Uh, so it's th these things kind of show up. The alignments show up in a few places, but as far as I know, um, they're only known for Brittany, um, and certainly the the density of, of Menir is greatest in Brittany in that area, um, but there, as I will show you, they're also found elsewhere. Um, a, a little bit further east in, in Normandy, um, in the upper left is the one that um, is Bretteville. Uh, that's the other one that was in the postcard uh, with a little girl uh, sitting alongside it as a, a different view of it. Uh, here are a couple of others. So they extend not only from Brittany, but up into the area um, around the, up, up towards the Seine uh, in, um, in Normandy, uh, out on the landscape. Um, but our, our favorite, our favorite and the one that we had great fun going around is La Rochefe. This is in Southeastern Brittany in Ile Vilaine. Um, and it is a, um, it, it, it's one of the Ali, largest Ali Couvert that is known. Um, and I, I, I put down the bottom um, that there are 41 blocks. Uh, there's a story behind that. Uh, there are, um, um, that's the number I got from the um, website of the Département Ville et Vilaine. Um, and the, the story is that there is a local legend that if a young couple want to see whether they're compatible, uh, what they should do is each one walk around La Rochefe in, in opposite directions and count the number of stones. And if you do that, if they do that, the, the, the degree to which they agree on the number of stones will be an indication of how, how happy their marriage will be. And Kim and I did this when we were there and we went around it and we came up with totally different numbers. Um, the, uh, we came up with totally different numbers. We said, no, 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 this isn't working. So each one of us went around it in the opposite direction than we had, um, done the first time, and we also came up with very different numbers, but a little bit closer to each other. Um, and none of our none of our, our measures or none of our counts of the number of blocks at La Rochefe agreed with the number that was in the Guide Michelin. Um, so anyway, that's, um, you know, we've been married for over 45 years, so I, maybe the legend doesn't work with everybody. But, I, but the final note on this, I, the, the 41 blocks is the official departemental uh, um, uh, count of the number of blocks. 
Um, I happened to click on the Wikipedia story for it, and they had a different number. So not, not even everybody agrees on what, what it is. But it is a very impressive uh, uh, couvert. It's very large. Um, some of the stones, one that I put there, the largest one is about 45 tons. Uh, they came, but they were moved from a quarry. It's about five kilometers away from the site. Um, and it is, it's one of the few that is known to be aligned um, uh, with, the, with the sun. Uh, the, at the winter, the dawn at the winter solstice, the, um, the sunlight shines through the entrance all the way, pretty much along the whole length of the, um, uh, of the Ali Couvert. Uh, so it's a, uh, um, there is a solstice orientation. We don't know how many others have solstice orientations. Um, it's probably not fortuitous. Um, uh, people have argued back and forth on the so-called uh, alignments of, of Stonehenge for years, and it doesn't stop the, the people dressed up like Druids and lots of other people from converging on Stonehenge a couple of times a year, especially for the, uh, for the summer solstice, uh, when they're not going to get drowned in rain and mud and the rest. But anyway, La Rochefe, if you're ever anywhere near southeastern uh, Brittany and Ile Vilaine, um, as as they as the as the Guy Michelin says, ça vaut le détour, ça vaut le voyage. Okay, let me continue on down on down the coast. Uh, there are a couple here are a couple that are in the vicinity of Saumur. Uh, some of you may have may know of Saumur as a uh, uh, one of the great uh, stables breeding for, uh, stables for horses uh, in um, in France. Uh, Bagneux is, uh, is, is near, very close to Saumur. May I, if I remember right, it's actually in, within Saumur. Um, the others are in the immediate surrounding area. Um, there are others in the area. Uh, Pontigny, um, by the way, that, that this is a, our, the picture of Pontigny there is one that we took um, uh, probably in the 1990s, uh, all overgrown. If you look it up on the web now, you'll see and it's all nice and tidy and the grass around it is the brush is all cut back and it's all nice and clean, et cetera. Uh, a lot of these have been cleaned up in the last 20 years or so and, and look a lot prettier. But to me, at least they're, they're, they're a lot more meaningful. If you kind of look at them, dans la nature, um, you, know, you know, as they originally, uh, as, as they have been for, for century, if not millennia. Um, Pontigny, but Pontigny is a, a nice little one. Um, I like the one at the lower, the lower half. It's just a little one. Uh, it's a little village called Mir. Um, uh, it's called La Maison, Dolmen de la Maison des Fées. Um, it's just by the side of the road, um, next to a pasture. Uh, it's three vertical rocks and a, and a capstone. It's just there. It's just part of the landscape. Um, you know, people drive by all the time. You just kind of Drive along the house in the background. That I believe there's a house across the street. Um, that they're all just kind of there, and there's something about kind of turning a corner, and there they are. Um, if you go a little bit south um, to uh, into the département de Sèvres, um, there's a whole complex which is known as 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 Bougon. Um, it's a uh, Again, it's it's there are as the slide shows there are multiple tumuli, um, a b one b two etc. Uh, Bougon has been very much cleaned up. It's a national park. Uh, there is a museum there that has all kinds of stuff on prehistory. Um, it's a very it's a very well developed, very uh, um, educational uh, area. They have all kinds of things for children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, it has the, these tumuli uh, in varying, varying states of completeness or repair. Um, they are, uh, uh, again, uh, they, appear, they appear to be mostly of rock, although there are, there are capstones and the like. There's also alongside them a Pierre Levé, uh, which may very well have been covered over with um, 
with a with, with a stony tumulus, a cairn of stones uh, at some point. Uh, Bugol has has been a center of a lot of research over the years um, on um, on this whole period, and I'll I'll come back to one of the things that has been done with it um, uh, towards the end. The area that we actually spent most of our time and where we got started doing our Chasso Dona Bend um, is, is in Poitou Charente, uh, the central western area of France, in particular in the uh, Département of Charente. Um, and um, one of our favorites, which is uh, in that area, is this one called saint fort sur le uh, It's a little village down the hill. Uh, down the hill is this little village that you go through. And as you go up this dirt track, um, you wind up this dirt track uh, in the middle of the vineyards at the top of a hill, um, there is this, um, this Pierre Levé uh, with a, uh, a, few, a few uprights uh, holding up three, three uprights that don't look very strong holding up this massive, this massive slab, this massive chunk of, of, of rock. Uh, you know, this is this one's also been estimated somewhere around forty tons. Um, the um, the uprights uh, the uprights I, I believe are in are limestone, which is not all that solid. The um, the top is uh, is sandstone. This is an area. That, by the way, the area that Brittany, the rock in Brittany is mostly metamorphic rock. Uh, it's known as the Massa of American. Um, uh, the, a lot of the stone, a lot of the these megaliths in Brittany are made out of these very hard stones. Uh, most of the central western area of France is is um, is sedimentary rock, uh, mostly limestone uh, and a certain amount of sandstone. And the rock there tends to be a bit softer. So often these things are a bit more eroded on the surface uh, or pitted on the surface. You can see that a little bit in the upright stones at saint fort sur -Dene. But there, this was just one of those um, one of those little places where you go through a village, you wander up, there's a little sign by the side of the road um, that has an arrow and says Dolmen, and you wander on up there, um, and there's this impressive uh, megalithic monument. The, pic the two pictures on the, on the left are from when we were there, um, the one on the right is off the web, and what doesn't show there is there's now a little plaque next to it, and it's all it's all tidied up. Um, as I said, we prefer them dans uh, la nature. Um, not far from there, um, actually in the area of Cognac, the town of Cognac, uh, Saint-Brice, um, is another one that's very uh, impressive. Again, on the... Um, on the upper left is a picture of Saint Brice uh, as we saw it, alongside a vineyard, half overgrown, disappearing into the uh, um, the brush and the trees. Uh, on the left, the upper left is what it looks like more recently, uh, all nicely tidied up. Um, again, it, this one has two capstones, and it's and but it's an impressive, uh, another nice one off in the countryside. Another one um, near Saint Brice is, is is the one in the in the middle below uh, Rocher de la Fache, which, um, as you can see, is collapsed. Uh, the upright stones are kind of piled up underneath the um, the capstone. And after after a few a few thousand years, it's not surprising that this would happen to some of them. Um, you know, and then there are others that are scattered around. Um, you know. Bessé, the Fonteville uh, one in the upper left, uh, is mostly what you see now is the cap zone, this chunk, big chunk of rock out in the middle of a wheat field um, where uh, it, it should not belong. Um, we love the one, the, the one of Pierre Foll and Montmoreau um, is, a, is a really nice one, kind of tucked into the woods. Uh, and, and around the corner from it, is a um, uh, is a uh, a cognac and pinot uh, uh, place a vineyard um, uh, do, uh, which is the do, you know named after it the Dolmen de la Pierre Fon, where you you can buy and taste vent et dégustation of pinot and cognac this is con this is cognac country um, 
And uh, speaking of cognac, there are uh, there are dolmen in the town of Cognac. Uh, I, there's a picture of one there. There's another one which I did, which I don't have a picture of. Um, and it's again, it's just sitting by the side of the road, a little corner, um, and people they've cleared away from it, and and there it is. Um, and 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 look at the look at the thickness of the Grosse Perrot. Uh, that's um, a, you know, I just look at those things and say it, it, it's an enormous amount of rock. We actually, I have a picture of those. It's not a very good picture of La Grotte Perrot from when we were there. And you can barely see the rock. It's totally overgrown. Uh, it's on a little rise in the in the middle of the field. Uh, it's, um, it, again, uh, today it's been cleaned up around. Um, the, uh, these are scattered other ones in, in Poitou, uh, into the Massif Central, in the Central West, over towards the Massif Central. Um, and, and I included them here to, to show that to kind of the spread of them. That, that, that there are lots of them in the Charente area, but as you go further inland, as you go um, over towards, they, they're, they're there. Um, Verliac in, in Haute-Vienne, um, is a lovely one. We actually have that. We have photographs, which I'm not going to show, uh, um, of e e each of us, me and Kim. Uh, we obviously took turns sitting underneath that one. We have photographs sitting underneath it, um, and uh, I guess we figured at the time that it's been sitting like that uh, for something on the order of six thousand years. It probably was not fall on us. Uh, but it's a, uh, it certainly does look precarious, um, but it is, but it is still there. Um, and, you know, there's one in Cajas, which is north of the Dordogne, uh, another one in Vienne, which is the area around Poitiers. Um, and there's one in Puy-de-Dôme. Puy-de-Dôme is, uh, is in the, is the area around Clermont-Ferrand, um, you know, most of the way over towards Lyon. Um, so scattered across this area, they become less common as you go inland from the coast, um, but they're still there through this area. Um, there are a variety of ones in um, uh, the, in the Dordogne, a little bit kind of south. Um, the one at uh, Brantome, it's it's actually it's in the middle of the town of of, of Perigue. Um, it's right, uh, you know, like, again, it, you drive by it, I drive by it on a city street, and there it is. Uh, the other two are, are buried off in the, uh, buried off in the woods. Um, and again, you, you're partially, partially cleaned up, partially excavated, um, uh, sitting there, sitting out there uh, to uh, be, to wander around. Trying to find some of these is, um, is a lot of fun. Um, because some of them are, as I said, some of them are very well marked. Uh, others are just kind of off in the woods, and and that's the, you know what we call la chasse aux dolmen. They they extend down into the Barle, uh, into the Gironde, entre deux mers. Um, there there are a number of them um, uh, uh, throughout that area. Um, one of the that we. Uh, when we were doing our Chasseau de Men, we were doing it from from Bordeaux, going kind of inland and 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 a little bit north of there, uh, where you get into the limestone areas. Um, but you know, south of Bordeaux, some of you know may may know is the very large area known as Londe, Les Londes, um, which is basically sedimentary rock. Um, and it's sand, shifting sands, and uh, now it used to be uh, uh, occupied by villages of shepherders. Uh, shepherds is now um, it's now mostly covered with pine trees, uh, it, uh, which dates to the 19th century. Um, Leyland is basically sand um, for miles and miles and miles. And on the um, uh, on the the map of EJ, the EJN map, the Institute uh, Geographic National Map that we have, like the one I showed you at the beginning, um, there was a, uh, a megalith. I forgot. I think uh, I think a dolmen um, indicated on it, and we thought, hey, you know, we'll go out and find you know a dolmen out in Lelande. And we went out 
to find it. And we wandered around the countryside, uh, looking here and there and everywhere. And we never found it. And we got back to Bordeaux. We sat down with colleagues and friends. And we told them that we'd spent the afternoon trying to look for a dolmen in Le Long. And they thought this was hilarious that anybody would look for a big chunk of rock out in the lawn because there is no rock out there. But I swear it's out there somewhere. We just didn't find it. Uh, but you know, it you know, people move people move back then move rock over enormous distances, and it's very likely um, that there is that there is something out there that they would have moved something out into the lawn. Um, that's kind of a little tour of of megaliths down the. Um, uh, through Brittany and down the western coast, uh, coast of France. Uh, if you remember back to the um, map that I showed at the beginning, uh, one of the areas uh, for the early ones is in um, the, the area that's known as Houssillon. This is, uh, it's largely the department of Pyrenees Orientales, the Eastern Pyrenees. It, uh, it the largest city there is Perpignan. Um, and if you look at the, the map, it actually extends the area of Formegalus, extends through the Eastern Pyrenees down into Catalonia. Um, these are a few, we had we never went looking for Formegalus in that area. We never took a vacation there um, that we've wandered through. Uh, these are a few examples of uh, of Menier and Dolmen from uh, from Roussillon, from that area. Um, I have also found a number of images of them in North, from northern Catalan, uh, from northern Catalonia, from the um, from the foothills of the of the Pyrenees, the Eastern Pyrenees, on the southern side as well as on the northern side. Uh, this is a little pocket of them where people uh, were were doing doing this as well. Um, I'm, uh, I'm showing these because it's actually part of France, and this talk is about um, megalithic monuments in France, but it's all it's all part of the whole. Um, so that's a, that's kind of a fairly quick show and tell uh, through megaliths in France. There are many many others, um, and uh, they're they're just sort of. You know, as I said, they're out there. Um, but let me make a, a, some comments about about, about context. Um, these are all uh, ne uh, Neolithic in age. Um, they're they're prior to the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age comes in um, uh, after all of this, sometime around uh, 3000, 2500, 3000 BCE. Um, the um, as as the the name implies, it's Neolithic or New Stone Age. Uh, the tools, as and there's some examples shown below here. Um, their their tools were entirely either perishable materials like wood, or they were made of stone, uh, flake stone and ground stone, um, as in the the ground stone axe on the left in that picture. Um, they had no metal tools. Um, their uh, there we know from from ethnographic uh, parallels in parts of the world where people continue to use stone axes that they can be very effective at cutting down trees and doing a variety of other things with them. Uh, if they're made out of hard rock, um, hard metamorphic rock, they can be very effective at uh, at chipping rock, at doing things like that, engraving rock. Um, but um, they are, uh, th 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 these are the tools these people had. Um, they lived in villages. Th there's in, in abundant archeology span of, of villages. Uh, these picture that I uh, included here is actually a reconstruction of a village near Stonehenge in Britain, uh, but very similar ones have been, the foundations and, uh, and the like have been found for very similar ones. Uh, uh, across France, there were a lot of Neolithic people in in France. They were village farmers. Um, they lived uh, off of. They had crops that we associate with with your early European agriculture: um, wheat, wheat and barley, uh, and the and the like. Um, 
they had a few domestic animals. They had domestic cattle. They had um, uh, uh, sheep and goats um, and a few, a few like that. They also spent a lot of their time hunting and fishing and gathering natural foods. Uh, it was a very mixed economy. They basically did what they could, combining agriculture and hunting and gathering uh, to get by. They lived in these little villages uh, of, you know, and uh, it would have been, um, uh, you know, fairly small groups of people. We're talking about in any one village, a few hundred uh, at any one time. Um, and the organization of it, I, I put their community level organization, uh, that is the, the primary unit is gonna be the village or a group of villages um, in an area. Um, and there's very little evidence for, um, uh, there's very little evidence for any kind of organization at a larger level, at a larger geographical level than, than the village or, or a set of villages. Um, there was a lot of trade, specialized raw material, high quality flint, um, other things like that, uh, high quality raw material. We know traveled over very long distances. Uh, there's an area in the, in the, uh, in the Loire Valley uh, known as Grand Précigny that yielded very the large pieces of very, very high quality flint. And you find Grand Précigny flints uh, distributed in the Olympic sites across across France. Uh, there's there's some forms of metamorphic rock that was court to record in Brittany that were that were traded um, from village to village um, down down the French coast and other areas. Um, so that these villages were out there, were interconnected, but the basic level uh, of organization uh, was was pretty much local. And there's there's very little evidence for any kind of social hierarchy or certainly any kind of inherited uh, um, uh, hierarchy. Uh, in, in other words, the leaders in the villages were probably basically the more experienced and, and the older individuals uh, who had particular uh, uh, talents, etc. cetera. Um, so, so in other words, any kind of activity is, and that, and that, by the way, that inference comes from things like the burials in which there is very little differentiation in burials across um, uh, across these uh, populations. Whereas in uh, when you get into the Bronze Age, where there's clear evidence for for chiefs or or, or headmen of some form or another, you start getting differential richness of burials and 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 other signs of that kind of status. So we're looking at community level organization of people who are getting together. Um, they had their own strength, their own activity, their own abilities. The only animal power they had were oxen. Uh, there's actually very good evidence now um, that uh, oxen, that the cattle um, were in fact used as for, for traction. Um, uh, there's uh, indications of yokes being put on on the, on the necks uh, of these of these uh, of these cattle from characteristic damage to the skulls uh, and the like. Um, so they had they had oxen for traction, and then they had themselves. And so the the, the this relates to um, the question of how did they move and raise these stones? And as I've said a number of times. Uh, these things weighed many tons, many tens of tons of weight. Uh, these are huge chunks of rock. Um, uh, and they, a, the actual sources of all of them um, are not known, uh, but clearly at a number of them, and I gave the example of the Hoshofe, where they where the source for the stones was four or five kilometers away. Um, these things were moved over long distances. And of course, the, the best example, although it's a bit more recent than these, um, are, are the blue stones from Stonehenge, uh, at Stonehenge, which were moved from, from the middle of Wales to, um, to Somerset uh, across a long distance and probably floated on the river. Um, one of the things, the, 
at, at Bougon, I, I mentioned that a lot of work had been done at Bougon, and one of the things that they did at Bougon was to try to figure out how these how these rocks were moved and how they were um, uh, and, and how they were lifted. And this is was a picture from the work that was being done at Bougon of a a reconstruction um, of uh, uh, how to, of of log rollers and and rope uh, and, and logs, um, they basically came up with whatever. But none of these things are preserved. We don't, as far as I know, there are no ro log rollers preserved. There's none of that preserved. Um, but what the archaeologists did was just to say, given the limits of Neolithic technology and the resources that they had available to them. Um, how could they have put together um, machines of some kind or another to actually move these rocks? And these log rollers like this was one of the things that they came up with. Uh, they obviously would have had ro uh, ropes of various kinds. Um, there is some evidence that they built earthen ramps um, to, to lift them up uh, and um, the um, to actually, so, you know, in, in terms of, you know, you're rolling one of these things, not, you know, rolling it on the horizontal like this picture is, is, is one question, you know, rolling this up a, a 10 or 20 degree slope, very long ramp uh, to put it on top of uh, um, supporting stones is, is another matter. So it would have been in, included um, both the rollers and, and ropes of one kind or another. Um, and there are um, there have been ideas of using various kinds of tilts, especially for for raising up the mania um, and getting them up, uh, getting them up high. The reality is we really don't know how they did it, um, but however they did it, I'm I, for one, I'm very impressed. And just some just some some final comments um, on why did they bother? Um, the ultimate question is. We really don't know, um, or the, excuse me, the ultimate answer is we really don't know. Um, so, some of the dolmens served as as burial uh, localities. Um, there were e either for a, a, a lineage or a community um, where it became a common burial place, probably used over an extended period of time, possibly over centuries. Uh, uh, the um, there are many, many accounts, uh, mostly from the 19th century, of, of people, people digging out bones, human remains from um, um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, from these various um, dolmen. If, for those of you who are Sherlock Holmes fans, you may remember the doctor in The, the Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, who is going around collecting skulls out of the various uh, passage graves out on the moors. Um, there are lots of more official uh, examples of them. Most of them, most of them were cleaned out in one way or another as they were known in through the centuries. Um, and the relatively few were th th that have been excavated systematically where we really know exactly what was going on. But it's very likely that people were um, buried really isn't the right word. People's people's remains were placed in these um, in these alley couvertes, and uh, over time, as their bodies decomposed and more people, the community died. The bones were pushed aside, and more um, more remains, more more bodies were put in. Um, th this seems to be pretty clear for the Alley Couvert. It's unclear for the for the Pierre Levé, and that may very well have to be uh, due to preservation. Um, they're just not. Uh, um, uh, uh, they're more open. It's more. It's less of an enclosed space. Um, for the Menier, uh, the idea has been for a long time, and probably is not a bad one, that they're a central place marker. That is a a, a, pl a place of focus for community activities of one kind or another. Um, it th that does not explain the alignments, um, aside from. Uh, the various von Donigan like uh, things that have been suggested for them. Um, the, uh, 
um, there's there's a, there's um, there are really very few explanations that I'm aware of for the alignments that really make much sense. Uh, certainly, back for people in the Neolithic. Uh, solar orientation, a great deal has been done about the solar orientation or the supposed solar orientation at Stonehenge. Uh, it's also been pointed out that there are enough stones at, um, at Stonehenge that, um, that if you, you can pick just about any day of the year and you're going to find an alignment for the, uh, for the sun at, at Stonehenge. Um, but that's not going to stop the people from going out there and having a party uh, once a year. Um, all, all luck to them. Um, uh, the winter solace sunrise at La Roche uh seems to be a very good candidate. Uh, it certainly seems to line up along a uh, long, uh, long distance through the middle of the of the Alley Couvert. It, um, I'm not aware of people who've gone around um, looking at the orientations of the other ones scattered around um, Brittany and, and Western France. But my impression is, is that orientations are pretty, pretty haphazard um, uh, around for it. And, and I put just for the fun of it, uh, um, as a joke, uh, nobody, nobody moves 40 ton rocks for the fun of it. Um, they must have had some very good reason for doing it. Um, and given their technology, uh, given their, the sizes of their communities, et cetera, they clearly spend an enormous amount of effort and time uh, creating all of these, uh, all of these megalithic monuments. Uh, yes, they span over a thousand years uh, of construction of them, um, but even cumulatively over that period of time. Uh, the, one, the, one kind of final comment on this is that they must have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort uh, doing this. Um, and what that says is that they, however hard life may have been, and their farmer hunting and gathering kinds of existence suggests that their lives were not easy. Um, that they they had the time, they had the interest, and they had the social cooperation and sense of community um, that made it possible. So it's really a window on the people, as well as a window on people doing very impressive things. So let me. Um, I'm going to stop there. I'm. I'm. I've filled up the hour. Um, there are a whole bunch of questions. Uh, in the, in the chat box. Um, yes, Eric, can you take it off share yeah, screen? Yeah, yeah, and there, there are a bunch of questions from Judy about, oh, well, the, 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 were the entrances, were they aligned with the solstices? And I, I just talked about that. Uh, how, how did they raise the rocks? I think I've gotten as about as much, um, told you about as much of it. Um, the, does the French government protect them? Um, technically, yes. Uh, places like Carnac, Loch Maria Caire, Barlenez, uh, Bougon, um, La Roche aux Fay, the big ones are, are certainly protected. Uh, the ones that are off in the woods here and there, um, Increasingly, they go around and kind of tidy them up, uh, remove any picnic garbage that people have left behind, you know, empty mineral water bottles or whatever. Um, but as far as I know, there's, you know, you know, technically, if they catch somebody doing damage to one of them, um, there, there are laws that protect them. You know, they are part of the patrimoine and they are registered, uh, but how effective they can be at protecting them, I'm not sure. But except for the ones but there, that... Eric, let me add that some of them are on private property. And although the immediate land around them is considered part of the National Monument, there's usually a, a path leading to them. Yeah. And what people ask is that if you mean to visit, that you stay on the path and try not to damage any crops that may be in the vicinity. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
do Bretons feel a sense of pride? Um, I, I don't I think know. we need a Breton to answer that question. It's hard yeah. to speak for somebody else's sense of community or, or ethnicity. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are Bretons that feel, that feel, feel, feel a sense of pride. Um, people have made connections between the engravings at, uh, at Gavrinus and Celtic art. And yes, there are certain, certain similarities, whether there is a connection there over several thousand years. I guess the, the oldest distinctly Celtic art is probably Bronze Age. Does that make sense, Kim? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but Gavrinus is definitely, and Newgrange are, are definitely. Yeah, yeah Newgrange in Ireland. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, so, so along those lines. Yeah. Um, yes, there is no graffiti, and yeah. that's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. A, 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 I'm not aware of. It. Yeah, yeah, I'm not aware of it. You know, I didn't just pick pictures that did not have graffiti. I'm not aware of any graffiti on these. That doesn't mean there isn't any. Um, but um, they, I don't. I don't remember seeing any. Kim, did we see any? I don't. No. Uh, As for their purpose, Linda, that we sort of answered that question, but basically we just have guesses. That there seems to even in these small scale societies, there seems to have been a desire for people uh, once or a few times a year to get everybody together, to, to get a larger group of people together to for all kinds of social exchange. And that sometimes these activities, these collective activities were carried out that even though the villages themselves were quite small, you can see examples of that in this country as well. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate your pointing this out. I lived in France for 20 years and did several trips to Brittany, but I didn't know anything about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Cassidy, your question about the domed stone roofs, they're, the, the way they're done is, is by piling up the stones so that they each one gets a little bit farther toward the center. So it's not a dome in the sense of a, that you would find in a Romanesque uh, cathedral, it's they're they're corbelled, so mm -hmm. it's just the weight of each stone that's holding them in place. Yeah, and yeah. they they sort of have a have a keystone, but not exactly. Yeah, if you remember back to the picture of, of Bernanese, there was one picture that had um, one of the chambers that's exposed and had vertical solid rocks on the side, and then, then the other with a corbel vault, vault where they they um, um, move the stones in to form the roof um, uh, of that little chamber. Uh, the, the, kind of the, the flip side of that, the mirror of that was used on the outsides of them um, to build them so, uh, uh. Okay, how are yeah, these- It's basically the weight of the stones themselves that yeah, holds yeah, the construction yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah, by that by the way, back to the um um the the question about uh, about um protection. Um in the 1950s, uh the uh, a, a local um constructor or farmer or somebody uh took a front loader and started removing stones from Barnanez. And at, at that time it was not it was not closely protected. In fact, the first uh, the first time Kim and I visited the site was in the 1980s, and at that time we just it was just there. Uh, you know, I think the the grass had been cut back around it like a hayfield, uh, but other than that, it was just there. We we visited it again uh, in uh, I think 2010, and um, and at that time there was a fence all the way around it, um, and um, uh, and you had to go through a little entrance area and pay, you know, a, a tourist office and pay a, a, an entrance fee and the like. Actually, I, actually, our, as, as I say that, our photographs from the 1980s show chain link fence immediately around the whole thing. And by the 2000s, they'd removed the chain link fence right up next to it put a fence much further around, much further on the outside, but then, but then controlled the uh, controlled access uh, through an office. Um, how do you, how do you study them since there's not much left? Um, 
it varies. Uh, there is stuff left a little bit, an awful lot of them, um, some of them still have archaeological material buried um, underneath them and around them. Uh, very often it's things like pieces of stone tools and, and potsherds, which, is, which can be used to give an indication of how old they are, uh, assuming that they are directly associated with it. Um, the, um, there's um, uh, um, a lot of them are just simply mapped in, you know, mapped and described in detail and recorded as such. Um, the uh, in terms of metamorphic rock, I'm not aware of any volcanoes in Brittany, but you know, you know, metamorphic rock includes magma welling up, includes granites, includes uh, you know, inc <laughs> includes a lot of what. Vermont mm -hmm. is made out of, um, mm -hmm. and um, and the, if that's if, actually if you um, the the only the only large concentration of volcanic uh, rock in um, in uh, France that I'm aware of is around Puy de Dome. Uh, there are a series of extinct volcanoes at um, of which Puy de, Puy de Dome itself is one. Okay, we, uh, yeah, the winter solstice and yeah, Grays in Ireland. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and a bunch of thank yous. Well, you're all very welcome. Um, we had fun doing this. We had fun wandering around the countryside <laughs> and, uh, doing our Chasso Don Men, as, I re as we referred to it to. And, and we had fun putting this together. Um, there, I, I even, it, it brought back a lot of what we had done in the past um, and it helped kind of put it back into context for us and, and, and we're glad to share it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. Au revoir à tout le monde. Au revoir, à la prochaine.